Hi, everybody. It's nice to be here with you uh, this good, fresh morning. As Nancy said, uh, I've been involved with uh, Kivira off and on for a long time. I think I spoke at the first Kivira conference, which was a long time ago in the 1990s, I think. Um, so I'm just, I'm, and, and at other conferences since then, so I'm sort of a, like a bad check. I just keep bouncing back. Anyhow, it's nice to be here at this one. Um, I'm going to talk about one of the themes that Nancy mentioned right at the end there. Times are tough. This last summer, you probably saw in the news, a whole Greek island was combusted. Uh, there were terrific fires in Italy and Turkey. We had more fires in the Pacific Northwest. We had yet another year of California flambe, uh, terrible things. And, and while all that was going on, there was more land burned in Siberia than in all those other places combined. Plus the floods in Belgium and Western Germany. And uh, gosh, we've got a hurricane season that's still going on. And for the second year running, the weather services have run out of names in the alphabet for the number of tropical storms brewed in the Atlantic. Um, these are tough times. And you people do great work. I know all of you are pulling on some kind of ore to make this earth a better place. And that goes also for those of you out there who are watching this uh, uh, or listening in remotely. I thank you for what you do. Um, but if you're like me, as hard as you're working, there are times you question whether your efforts matter or if they will be canceled by forces beyond your control. And that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about facing the flak facts of our planetary situation without flinching but also without giving in to despair or apathy or cynicism or any of those other negative things. Now, there's a lot of room for platitudes on this subject, and I don't want to get into them. The only honest way I can talk about this is to share with you my own journey in wrestling with, these, uh, with this, this fundamental problem. And my journey involves a, a trilogy of books, three books. I hope you'll forgive me if I mention them. And I hope also that this slide gizmo will actually work. We'll see about that. Um, in the course of those books, I think I learned some pretty decent answers to this problem. But I hasten to add that what worked for me might not work for you. And I just encourage you to really think about the journey that you take and to take it with intent. My journey, and let's see if this will work. Not yet. How about the next slide? I'll just ask you guys, ask you, Lynn, to. My, my journey began actually at a Kavira conference in 2006 when uh, a scientist from the University of Arizona, Jonathan Overpeck, put this slide up on the screen. And you can see that the Southwest is an alarming color of red and, and uh, orange, uh, warning colors. This slide, uh, this map, shows predicted surface stream flow in mid-century, 2015. I looked at this and I realized, I was sitting kind of daydreaming in a conference, as some of you all probably are right now. I was, I, I woke up when I saw this image because I realized that those warning colors threatened the future of my beloved Southwest, of the land that I love. What they say is that we can expect by mid-century a 20% decrease in surface flow of our rivers 
even though when this came out in 2005 and 6, we were already dangerously over allocated. So I knew that this was going to transform our region, this, this loss of surface waters. And I resolved then, I wanted to go and talk to the guy who was behind this, who happened to be a guy named Chris Milley at a big laboratory outside Princeton, New Jersey. Um, I wanted to find out how that map evolved. I wanted to write about it. And that effort, next slide please, resulted in, in this book, A Great Aridness. That book came out in 2011, 10 years ago. Since that time, we've been able to see that the prophecies outlined in it have all been coming true. They've held up, only they're arriving faster than the models had predicted. We're getting hotter and drier. We've got less surface water. We're moving into a new normal that's more or less the equal of droughts of the, of the, the most severe droughts of the past. Precipitation for the Southwest is somewhat a mystery, especially summer precipitation. But even if precipitation stays steady, we wind up drier than before because with higher temperatures, we've got more evaporation, a lot more. It's not a linear relationship between temperature and evaporation, but evaporation moves up faster than temperature does. The warnings were dire and accurate, and a lot of good people have striven to avert the, the, the catastrophes that they forecast. But a lot of other people haven't done a damn thing. So far, the second group seems to be winning. Here, another slide, please. Here's the only other data slide I want to show you. This is the Keeling curve. Can you get that slide up, Lynn? There we go. Um, this shows atmospheric CO2, and I don't know how well you all can see it, but 1965, oh, this isn't going to work out here in this light anyhow. In 1965, President Lyndon B. Johnson was warned about the consequences of CO2 pollution. 1989, Bill McKibben came out with the first big uh, uh, description of climate change for a popular audience, a book called The End of Nature. All these warnings, all these years, and we still haven't fundamentally done anything. You can see that the CO2 curve continues to go up and up and up. What it comes down to is we as a society, a world society, are following a kind of Thelma and Louise strategy, which is, you know, pedal to the metal, even if we're driving fast toward the rim of a canyon. A Great Aridness was the first book of the trilogy that I was working on. When I started, I didn't have the nerve to think in terms of a trilogy. It just kind of turned out that way. Virtually the same day that I sent off the final ma manuscript of Aridness, I left for an expedition in Southeast Asia. Next slide, please. We were headed for the mountains dividing Vietnam and Lao PDR which are one of the planet's hottest biodiversity hotspots. Next slide, please. We are going to look for one of the rarest large mammals remaining on Earth, the saula. Next slide. An animal, a bovid, a grazing animal, known to Western science only since 1992. No salas then existed in captivity, and none exist in captivity today. And at the time of our expedition, there might have been a few hundred of them in the wild. Uh, today, if there are a few dozen, we're doing pretty good. I'd like to tell you more about this animal, but I'm terrified of running out of time. We really went to the back of beyond in our pursuit of the animal. Um, next slide. We went beyond the last of the forest villages. We went beyond the reach of government. Next slide, uh, which uh, is why some of our guides were carrying 
AK-47s. We were in a, a place where there was a lot of conflict. We went to places that uh, the head of the expedition, biologist William Robichaux, uh, said had never been gazed upon before by blue eyes. We were going into some of the most verdant and productive diverse forest on the planet. Next slide. Um, but also some of the most ravaged. We were going to the front lines of humankind's war against wildlife. In the forest there, we encountered snare lines that were miles long, literally, all along a mountain ridge, all along a, a, across a canyon from one ridge to the other, so that no animal uh, except something the size of an elk could jump across these hedge lines of brush that were set with gaps in them and the snare in every gap. So that wildlife couldn't move through the forest without encountering these things. Slide, please. And we encountered all kinds of carnage. Here a ferret badger, next one. A silver pheasant, next one a juvenile large antlered muntjac, a critically endangered species, which in this case, since the carcass was fairly fresh, went into the stew pot that night of the expedition. We were, we, we, we were pretty low on food. These snares were set by poachers to supply the wildlife tra trade, which provides animals and animal parts for the so-called cures of traditional Chinese medicine, and also when the remains were at all edible for the restaurant trade. Thanks to economic prosperity in East Asia, there are many millions more people today than at any time in the past who can afford to buy exotic foods and remedies, and so the wildlife trade is booming, and as a result, more and more forests in South Asia and Africa and even South America are essentially empty. One biologist described it as, you know, these are forests where you can't find an animal larger than a cock cocker spaniel. We never saw a saula, nor sign of one, and the saula's slide for, toward extinction is continuing. It's just one more datum in the global shrinkage of biodiversity, which is not just a crisis of extinction, but also of crashing populations of thousands of species that until recently were abundant. I hasten to add that the wildlife trade is merely the most gruesome manifest manifestation of the war on wildlife. Population growth, industries of all kinds, including industrial agriculture, pollution, climate change, etc., and much more, all these powerful forces are reducing wildlife to a mere sliver in the pie chart of life. Next slide. The second book of the trilogy resulted from that expedition. And when I hit, finished that book, I hit a wall. I was heartsick. I was depressed and increasingly cynical and not a little bit numb. One image, next slide, particularly lingered. A red-shanked duke, perhaps the world's handsomest monkey, dangling upside down from its snare pole, its fur still soft and luminous, the earth only inches past the reach of its delicate hands. I felt haunted by its slow death from dehydration and despair. All that is background. What I really want to talk about is how to deal with that. I was not long back from Laos and Vietnam when something happened for me at Canyon de Chez. I was on the rim of the canyon. Next slide. It was October, a glorious time of year, and the cottonwoods were ablaze. Off to one side, I saw this image. Next slide, please. It was a white horse partway up a dune at the bottom of a cliff. The dune was corrugated with sheep trails, thorny, Inedible green shrubs stippled the sand. I couldn't imagine what that horse was finding to eat. The land was battered, almost barren. 
and yet I could not take my eyes from the view. A bright white horse amid emerald shrubs on purple red sand. The color, the contrast, the unadorned solitude of the horse, all the elements of the tableau converged in a way that was more than pretty, more than merely picturesque. I felt stunned and then inspired, although I couldn't then say how. I snapped some photographs, sensing that the horse and the land on which it grazed answered a question I had not known how to ask. Much later, I realized the photographs expressed something I had failed to grasp in the Lao forests. The realization was almost mathematical. It said, Earth's beauty is inexhaustible. Even where the world is most diminished, beauty remains. The forces that erode life, the, the life of the planet, can reduce but not eliminate that beauty, for beauty is intrinsic to the planet. Or if not to the planet, then to the way we sapiens have evolved to see it. And the beauty belongs to us. It inheres in us, and it needs to be conserved in us too, for we are part of the planet. That was not all. Think about it. If beauty is infinite, then the need, and for some of us the obligation, to defend such beauty is also infinite. This obligation will last as long as beauty lasts, and so it will have no end. I thought I was on to something, a piece of the puzzle I was trying to solve, or at least a fragment of a piece, but it was just the start. Then in 2016, next slide please, I was invited to join a medical expedition bound for one of the remote regions of Nepal, a place called Upper Dalpo, which some of you may have heard of, be, for it's the location of the nonfiction classic by Peter Matheson called The Snow Leopard. The expedition's purpose was to deliver primary, primary health care to people who rarely or never see a clinician. We were the Nomads Clinic. Next slide, please. A project of the Upayas Zen Center of Santa Fe. We included doctors, nurses, Buddhist clerics, supernumeraries like myself, and a large staff of guides, muleteers, and camp tenders. We were both a medical expedition and a pilgrimage bound for holy places. But I, and next slide, please. But I resisted the pilgrimage idea. I was no pilgrim, I thought. I was a hard boiled journalist and book writer. I was going on this 150-mile trek over five 17,000-foot passes in the high, cold desert between the Himalayan crest and the Tibetan plateau just to see a little country and to test an idea. The idea was this. Might it be time for people who care about Earth to begin thinking of themselves as hospice workers? Might the ethics and values of hospice lead to a kind of earth care that was more effective and also kinder to its practitioners than the relentless striving to fix things that I was accustomed to? Next slide. I was intrigued by two medical findings. First, that patients who go into hospice live at least as long and often longer than patients in comparable health who submit to drastic interventions. As Atul Gawande puts it in Being Mortal, the lesson seems almost Zen. You live longer only when you stop trying to live longer. Meanwhile, the quality of life enjoyed by hospice patients in their last weeks and months is incomparably superior. And this is true also for their loved ones and caregivers. While hospice nurses do, do not work less hard than nurses in ICUs or with less dedication, they are three times less likely to suffer major depression. Next slide. 
Our clinic would practice a kind of medicine similar to hospice and its cousin, palliative care. We would have no ac access to x-rays, scans, lab work, or surgery. Indeed, follow-up visits were all but impossible. So we would have to prioritize care over cure. And like good hospice workers, we would have to focus on making the present moment as good as it could be, and we would have to recognize our limits and not become attached to specific outcomes. Let me quickly say that applying the concept of hospice to earth care is an exercise in metaphor, and the metaphor is imperfect. Earth isn't dying. Irrespective of the damage we sapiens accomplish, life will continue on the planet as it has for billions of years. And it will continue until our sun dies billions of years from now. But still, so much of the creation of which we are a part, this present manifestation of life on Earth, is diminishing, moving down to a very thin sliver in the pie chart of life. Next slide. But back to the expedition. It took me six weeks on the trail in the 2016 trek and five weeks more on a return expedition in 2018 to realize fully that I was a pilgrim, that life is or should be a pilgrimage. Attaining that realization allowed me to complete the third book of my accidental trilogy, which is this one. Next slide, please. The Trail to Kanjiroba. The issue I thought I was going to the farther side of the Himalaya to wrestle down concerning the application of hospice ethics to earth care held up. Nothing I learned or experienced contradicted that hypothesis. But I mainly just came away with a list of slogans. Care over cure. Avoid attachment to specific outcomes. Optimize the present while also recognizing and honoring endings. Embody a strong back and a soft front, by which I mean you have to be ready for the hard stuff but not by shutting out the people and the creatures entangled in it. That was the way our clinicians behaved in the clinics, and they were truly inspiring. I could go on with those slogans, but contrary to my expectation, the real breakthrough for me turned out to be something else, something not so much in the mind as in the heart. I went on those journeys needing to make peace with sorrow. My delight in the beauty of the natural world had to coexist with grief at its destruction. These emotions were like cellmates who can't get along. They dwelled in my head and my heart, and their constant argument created a moral ache. I had to either dispel that ache or learn to live with it. Dealing with that sorrow became the real business of my travel in the Himalaya. I had to rekindle a sense of hope, but not a simple kind of hope. I had to find my way having lost it. I had to reconnect to Earth's beauty, not as adornment, but as nourishment. I also had to revise my understanding of science and what it's for. Not the science of power and control, but the science that swings open the gates of wonder. In the end, I found what I was looking for. I actually got answers to those questions, but I can only partly tell you what they were. And this is not a cheesy spoiler alert. I really mean it. The lessons don't compress down to sound bites. They work their way into you slowly. I try to summarize them in the final 16 words of the book. I'll tell you what that was. Every day a yatra. 
every situation a clinic, absorb the beauty, build an ark, be alive. I can unpack those 16 words for you a little bit, but really to grasp them in full, you have to take the journey, which is the whole book. Every day, a yatra. Yatra means pilgrimage. On a pilgrimage, you can't go missing. You have to show up and be present. And you have to be clear about your intentions. Especially in rough country and our everyday lives in cities, towns, on our farms and ranches can be very rough country. We are always learning to walk. We're always learning to walk the right way as a pilgrim. At the age of 72, I'm really still work learning to walk. Every situation a clinic. I so admired the clinicians I worked with. Their approach to each new patient, whether the case was simple or complex, whether joyful or gruesome, was an inspiration to me. Strong back. Soft front is just the beginning. When the caca starts hitting the fan, I try to imagine myself as a medico in one of those clinics, stepping up to the next challenging case. Absorb the beauty. Yes, it's nourishment. You have to make time for it, create space for it, and seek it out in the most unlikely places. Build an ark. This is where our work comes in. We return to the domain of metaphor. The diminishment of the natural world behooves us to become latter-day Noahs. We need to build arks, vehicles to carry the beauty and diversity of Earth's present creation across the inhospitable seas that lie ahead. Some of us, probably all of you, have been at this kind of work already, building arcs in the form of parks, wildlife refuges, reserved forests, wildlife corridors, restricted use zones. The potential designs are legion. Same thing for building soil, for finding alternatives to destructive practices in agriculture and ranching, for restoring balance to abused ecosystems. Old leaky arcs, like many of our national parks and other public lands, need an overhaul to become seaworthy. And even then, the voyage is sure to be rough. The imperative is to launch as many arcs as possible. Some will sink, some will be blown off course. Not all of them will make it, but the more we build, the more we'll get there. So we need to build away like good hospice workers without worrying too much about outcomes we can't control. Be alive. No explanation necessary, I hope. But I want to add that being fully alive means also being hopeful. But being hopeful in the deepest sense is not a simple business. So I'd like to close by just reading a very short passage from the book. It's only a little bit more than a page that is titled simply hope. This is the understanding I finally came to about what hope really is. Hope means different things to different people. In its simplest forms, it expresses a desire for things to turn out well, for a worrying story to have a happy ending. Most of the time, when people ask about hope, they're asking, will everything be all right? Can we return to how things used to be when this worry didn't exist? With regard to climate change, the answer is no. Too much CO2 and other heat-trapping gases already burden the planet's atmosphere and oceans. The effects will be with us for at least several lifetimes. We cannot draw a get out of jail card because none exists. But hope has other meanings. 
Václav Havel, the Czech dissident and later president of the Czech Republic, wrote, hope is definitely not the same thing as optimism. It is, not, it is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Havel was linking hope to the philosophical distinction between instrumental good and intrinsic good. Something is instrumentally good if it produces pardon me, a desired result. Its goodness depends upon outcome. But a thing is intrinsically good if doing it is virtuous of and by itself. That is, if its value exists independent of result. The essence of hope, Havel was saying, is to believe in the intrinsic goodness of right action. Through his many years as an outcast or in prison, fighting the Soviet domination of Czechoslovakia, Havel never knew, until the Soviet Union's final collapse, if his efforts would succeed. Yet he persisted in a spirit of hope, knowing his course was correct. The novelist Barbara Kingsolver also distinguishes between hope and optimism. In her view, and I'm quoting now, the pessimists would say, it's going to be a terrible winter. We're all going to die. The optimists would say, oh, it'll be all right. I don't think it'll be that bad. The hopeful person would say, maybe someone will still be alive in February, so I'm going to put some potatoes in the root cellar just in case. King Solver concludes, Hope is a mode of survival. I think hope is a mode of resistance. The hope she describes is close to the ecological notion of surprise. That sometimes big, consequential things happen with virtually no warning. An earthquake or the fall of the Soviet Union being good examples. To trust in the uncertainty of the future, believing in the possibility however remote, of beneficial change. This is the essence of hope. Of course, surprise is no panacea. It can be harmful as well as beneficial. A new coronavirus triggering a pandemic is a good case in point. But survive, surprise comes to us out of the vastness of what we don't know. It is amoral and a caring and, and, and uncaring. But it is also central to true hopefulness. The leader of our expedition, a, a, a Buddhist teacher, puts surprise and uncertainty at the center of her teaching. Placing trust in not knowing, she says, offers a strategy for dealing with dark times. Change is certain, and there is always a chance things will improve. Here is where King Solver's wisdom connects with Havel's. King Solver is talking about future surprise, the uncertainty of how the winter that lies ahead will turn out. Havel is talking about how we carry ourselves in the meantime. We have to do what makes sense, irrespective of outcome. In jail, Havel could not know if the Soviet Union would crumble during his lifetime. Nor could Nelson Mandela, during 33 years in prison, know when apartheid might similarly disintegrate. But when the long-desired surprise arrived, both men, having done what makes sense, seized the moment and helped render the surprise as beneficial as possible. The essence of their preparation was that they never lost hope. Neither should we. Thanks very much. Bill, with your permission, can we 
Can we uh, field a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. Are you game? Perfect. All right. Who's uh, brave enough to follow that up with a question? Don't everybody speak at once. Go for it. What's the next book that you're working on now? <laughs> I don't really know. I've got a couple of things in the oven, but uh, uh, I'm, I'm working on something that I think is going to split into two projects. So I have to kind of nurse it until it tells me what it wants to be. Thanks. Are you really 72? I am. Okay, well we had a moment back there. We both turned to each other and went, 72? Wow, he's killing it at 72. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, I've got one question behind you here. The previous speaker talked about generations and generations of knowledge and absorbing that knowledge um, within your life and how you kind of seek a path. Uh, how did you kind of find um, a path that you could feel hopeful on as well as take the knowledge you've in seen through these, these pilgrimages to actually find a place that seemed uh, stable footing for you to carry this hopefulness? Great question. I, there are so many components. I mean, our patients in the clinics were so inspiring. I feel as though they were teaching us all, me included, an awfully lot. Uh, the, the Tibetan people, uh, living very close to the land. They had a kind of cheerful stoicism that was inspiring every day. And uh, as Corrine said, you know, there was, we, we were walking on land through the air, uh, but we are also walking through an atmosphere of knowledge. And uh, the learning, we were all trying to learn something every day continuously and I kept thinking back to uh, what one of my favorite poets wrote a guy named Lou Welch recommend him to you uh, he said everything important in my life I found for myself and somebody else showed it to me first and uh, so you know the he also said uh, Oh, I wish I could recite the whole poem, but, but just being open to what's there is the most important thing. Letting it all flow through and uh, allowing yourself to be inspired on a daily basis. That's the heart of it for me. All right, let's take uh, one more. Are yeah, sure. Cool. Thank you very much for your inspiring delivery. Uh, my question revolves around the instrumental intrinsic good that you discussed and carrying forward with your actions and behaviors um, regardless of the outcome. And it, it begs the question about uh, what happens in the end. Because I have a goal and I am you know, ach achieving my goal and I believe it to be intrinsically good regardless of outcome. But if that goal for somebody else is not similar, then that changes. So how would you frame that? I mean, when we're talking about you know, the land, the water, and the people here, if we don't have the same goal, the intrinsic good can be very hard to discern. Can you comment on that? Well, yeah. I mean, so much of what we work for seems to go nowhere or lack of agreement in the society or whatever. And yet, so often the things we strive to do, the good, the intrinsic good that we're pursuing on a daily basis seeps out in ways we don't even know. It finds, it's like water, it finds its way through the watershed. Maybe it sinks into the soil and disappears for a long time but then it comes out in a spring somewhere we couldn't have imagined the location of at the outset. So this is part of that 
business of having faith in not knowing. And I think about it all the time. As a writer of best non-sellers, um, I just, sometimes I'm amazed that something I wrote 20 years ago struck one person, you know, 15 years later, who winds up doing something because of that in a way I could never have imagined. And uh, in fact, one book of mine, the, 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 the non-selling of all the best ones, um, it found one reader who was inspired because of it to make a movie. And that film is out there in the world. So, you know, I, I speak from the standpoint of a writer, but this is true for all of us. You know, no matter what we, what kind of work we do. And, you know, I'm, I bet there are teachers here. I bet all of you are in one way or another teachers because the things you do, you share with other people. And teaching is more like what I just described than probably any other activity humans are engaged in. So you just never know where where the quantum of goodness you try to produce is going to travel to. And you have to have faith in that and just keep producing that goodness no matter what. So thank you all very much.